Melissa Scholes. I am a pediatric ENT doctor at the University of Colorado Children's Hospital. Um, this lecture today is going to talk about something that's kind of basic, which is ear infections or ketotitis media, something we don't really manage much as primary care doctors do. Um, but it's good for us to know all the ins and outs of diagnosis and treatment. And then we'll talk about things we are more familiar with, which is the downstream complications. So our objectives today, we'll review the pathogenesis, diagnosis, and treatment. Um, we'll explore the pathogenesis of complications from otitis media, and we'll discuss some controversies of medical and surgical treatments. Otitis media is the second most common childhood illness after viral URIs, so very common um, family doctors, pediatricians, um, we see it. There's 24.5 million office visits a year, and the annual healthcare costs are $4 billion when you take into account uh, doctor's visits, antibiotic prescriptions, and uh, surgical interventions and complications. It is the most common reason for antibiotic prescription as well. So what is acute otitis media? We know it's an infection of the ear, but more importantly, it's actually inflammation. Inflammation is what the body produces in response to the infection. And inflammation uh, is what causes a lot of the side effects and symptoms that we see, um, like pain, um, uh, fevers, things like that. So we say inflammation of the middle ear space is a more correct definition. The predisposing factors um, for ear infections, more, most importantly, are immature immune systems and anatomy, um, which we see in kids uh, being the um, short floppy eustachian tube. Uh, what the colonization of the nasal pharynx is is also important. Um, URIs are a big predisposer of uh, ear infections, which we'll talk about more in a second. Smoke ex exposure, uh, the type of feeding, time of year, daycare, and genetic uh, background also influence uh, ear infections. So it is all about the eustachian tube um, and, the, and the, anatom the anatomic differences between kids and adults. In kids and infants, um, the eustachian tube, which goes from the anterior middle ear space into the nasopharynx, is much flatter. You can see the angle here gently sloping. When you compare it to an adult, it's more at a 45 degree. The eustachian tube is uh, made up of cartilage, um, uh, medially and bone uh, laterally. That medial portion um, is not a complete tube, but it's almost a U-shaped structure that's folded over on itself. And in kids, it's very much more floppy. And the short floppy tube makes it easier for things in the nasopharynx, the adenoid area to reflux back into the middle ear space. So along with colds, um, Otitis media does peak with viral activity, especially RSV, human metanumovirus, and influenza. So when there's a lot of colds around, such as winter, um, then we get a lot of ear infections. And that's because the cold itself causes the mucosal swelling and the fluid to um, get into the middle ear space, which then gets infected by the bacteria that we have naturally occurring in our body. Uh, smoke exposure, if parents are smoking, there's a fourfold increase in otitis media. Uh, bottle feeding instead of breastfeeding is predisposes to ear infections uh, for a couple of reasons. One is the antibodies that are found in breast milk are protective of ear infections. Um, but um, a lot of times the natural, um, the natural uh, position of, the, of a child is better when feeding, when breastfeeding, because the head is much more upright than the rest of the body and the, the milk and the um, secretions don't go into the nasopharynx. Daycare is a risk factor um, for uh, ear infections. There's nothing we can really do about that. Um, also genetic um, makeup. There's been uh, multiple studies looking at groups of, of, of people that have um, similar genomes, Pacific Islanders being one that are more uh, more inclined to have ear infections. Um, impaired host immune defenses, again, the immature immune system and bacterial colonization. If the, if the nasopharynx is colonized with strep pneumo, H flu, or Moraxella cateralis, they're more likely to um, uh, get ear infections. 
biofilms, it's something we'll talk about in a little in depth. Um, so there's a big correlation between nasopharyngeal biofilms in children with the tinnitus uh, media. Um, and what happens is in the nasopharynx, um, middle ear pathogens are, are present and they form a biofilm. And um, the biofilm then sheds planktonic bacteria um, you know, into the nasopharynx or oropharynx, and it also goes up the eustachian tube um, into the middle ear space. And when that happens, you can get a biofilm within the middle ear, and the same thing happens where it sheds this planktonic bacteria. So anytime there's a, a, an environment that is good for infection, such as when you have a cold, you get mucosal swelling, you get some fluid, the body can't clear as well, then um, this planktonic bacteria causes the acute otitis media. Oral antibiotics really only target planktonic bacteria. And so uh, that's what happens in recurrent otitis media. You treat a child with the antibiotic for 10 days and they get better, but as soon as they're off of it, it comes back because that biofilm is still there shedding bacteria. Um, and this causes long-term antibiotic resistance and again, recurrent otitis media. Biofilms, you know, this has probably been something that's you know, been talked about a lot over the last 15 years, but um, we know that they have poor antibiotic uh, penetration, um, and that's due uh, to the structure of the biofilm itself. There is, um, there are hydrophobic uh, proteins within them that, that uh, repel um, uh, mucosal secretions. Um, there's decreased nutrition and an oxygen requirement, so um, these uh, bacteria within the biofilms can have, uh, have a decreased metabolic uh, requirement. Even across bacterial species, they share resistant genes um, and mechanisms to avoid antibiotic and host immune responses um, through subtle cell signaling. Again, we talked about planktonic bacteria shedding. Very importantly, they do incite mucosal inflammation. And what happens with the mucosal inflammation is you get, um, mucosal dysfunction. So there's little cilia, as you know, on the, on the mucosa that sweep um, things away um, to be, into the eustachian tube that can be swallowed and then um, rid of, but the biofilms cause this mucosa to swell and then that um, function doesn't work. And so you get a buildup of fluid and bacteria. Um, and all these things help the biofilms if it made the host immune responses. We haven't um, been able to figure out how to fully uh, treat biofilms within, within the middle ear. Ear tubes actually do help biofilms because they disrupt the attachment of biofilms. They change the microenvironment of the middle ear. Um, and so there is a decrease in biofilms after ear tube placement. Some ear tubes have culture, um, have a antibiotic impregnation or have a metal in them that kind of disrupt the, the biofilms as well. Experiments have looked at pulsed laser therapy um, into the middle ear space, but this, uh, there's concern for um, hearing damage as well. Biochemical disruption with soap, soapy agents has been tried, but um, there is again uh, worry that some of these agents might cross the round window and cause uh, inner ear dysfunction, hearing loss being the most worrisome. Um, H. influenza is actually a big progenitor of biofilms, and so vaccination against H. flu actually decreases the, um, the risk of biofilm formation. And this is something newer. I, I found that <clears throat> vitamin D actually inhibits, helps inhibit uh, biofilm formation by upregulating antimicrobial peptides. And so vitamin D is a big area of interest um, within the last year of of trying to treat or prevent biofilm formation. Um, the American Academy uh, came out with a clinical practice guideline uh, looking at, at acute otitis media. And these things are very long. Um, they are produced by a big um, a panel of people that go through all the literature and they take the best evidence and kind of make their recommendations. When you read them, they are a little dry, but it does really help you understand the why behind a lot of our recommendations. So it is important to read them, especially if you're 
um, you know, pediatric ENT person like me because I do deal with acute hepatitis media so often. Um, so the newer guidelines that came out, we'll kind of go over in depth. And again, it's more to kind of help you understand the why behind some of the recommendations that makes it easier then to um, extrapolate the next steps as well as uh, educate families. So the essentials of diagnosis for acute hepatitis mean that came out a couple years ago is moderate to severe bulging of the eardrum or new drainage not associated with otitis externa. Mild bulging of the eardrum and less than 40 hours of otalgia or intense erythema of the, of, sorry, intense erythema of the eardrum is also acceptable. Um, but the most important thing is middle ear effusion must be present uh, as proven by pneumatic otoscopy and or tympanometry. And this was put in there because the previous guidelines um, basically just said a red eardrum, but that could be just from a patient crying. And so um, we've really kind of forced the hand of referring doctors to, to say, yes, there's infusion, um, either by them looking with, an, uh, with a pneumatic otoscope or using tympanometry in their office. Because a lot of times these kids come in and their eardrum looks perfectly normal and they go back to the pediatrician and the pediatrician's like, the, the eardrum's red and they really don't have an acute otitis media, they're just crying. So the most important part, portion of the diagnosis for acute otitis media is the presence of a middle ear effusion. Um, vaccination is important to talk about because um, we are expanding our pneumococcal coverage with the recent generations of vaccination. And it was thought that maybe ear infections would go down. Um, we initially saw a decrease in strep pneumo after vaccination became commonplace, but there has been an increase of infections by Staph aureus and H flu. And then also an increase in strep pneumo serotypes not covered by vaccination. Overall, um, there's been a decrease of otitis media by about six to 7% within the population since vaccination. So there's been a minor effect of vaccination, but there's still, um, a lot of infections per year. I mean, this is basic, but it's really important to drive home that um, it's really important to clear out cerumen in order to get a full view of the eardrum in the clinic. I mean, this is not easy on kids, I understand, but there's ways you can do it pretty gently. I usually just use this open-headed otoscope um, just because it's a little less scary than getting out a microscope. Um, it's really important to remove cerumen um, in order to get a clear view of the eardrum. And again, pneumatic otoscopy, just get in the habit of doing it on every eardrum because you will be able to tell the difference between normal and abnormal. Um, you know, we have the luxury of going to the OR and putting in ear tubes so we get that feedback of looking at an eardrum and sizing it and then, oh, there's fluid, oh, there's no fluid. And that goes a long way of in informing our clinical examination, but pneumatic autoscopy should be performed every time, especially on kids who have a lot high incidence of having clear effusions. And again, basic stuff, but this is a tympanogram. Um, we should be seeing in the normal eardrum a nice uh, A peak. Uh, a sub S is a shallow peak, usually a stiff eardrum. Uh, a sub D is a very loose eardrum. It's usually a thin eardrum from either infections or multiple sets of tubes. C is a retracted eardrum. There's still movement, but the uh, pressure gradient is uh, in the negative uh, area. And then a type B temp is what we call a flat temp, meaning there's fluid and there's no movement of the eardrum. And that is also uh, used for diagnosis of ear effusions. This is um, pretty common in pediatrician offices that may not be able to get a good view of the eardrum or don't uh, aren't comfortable doing pneumatic otoscopy, um, but they do have um, um, basic audiometry equipment to do tympanograms. So just kind of beating a dead horse, but pneumatic autoscopy has a sensitivity of 94% and a specificity of 80% for diagnosis of middle ear effusion. And it improves the accuracy of diagnosis by 15 to 25%. So again, very important to use it. Um, in the early 2000s, the trend for ear infections was not to treat them with antibiotics too aggressively. Um, and I think those were the 2003 guidelines and saying, you know, most kids don't need antibiotics and, um, um, you know, we'll do fine. However, um, studies came out after that showing that versus placebo, antibiotics decrease the duration of symptoms and decrease overall burden of symptoms, including 
doctor's offices, antibiotic prescriptions, um, and the cost of health care. So, so those are 2004 guidelines. Um, they also promoted, um, they also said the number needed to treat to prevent one episode of mastoiditis was about 4,800 people. But again, it relies on very accurate diagnosis and being comfortable not treating um, and not treating an ear effusion that may uh, be an active infection. So the updated guidelines um, are a little bit more pro-antibiotic with an accurate diagnosis. And this table um, is available in the guidelines and basically saying that very young children, six months to two years of age, should get antibiotic therapy, um, unilateral with severe symptoms or bilateral if there's otorrhea. Um, the only time they should not, excuse me, the only time they should not get um, antibiotics if there is a unilateral hepatitis venue without otorrhea um, and no kind of symptoms. And if there's greater than two years of age, um, you can even watch a kid with bilateral ear, uh, acute otitis media without um, ear infection, or sorry, without severe symptoms. But if they had otorrhea or severe symptoms, they should get antibiotic. They kind of went over what they deemed as symptomatic, which is a toxic appearing child with persistent ear pain, more than 48 hours, a high temperature, or if there is uncertain access to follow up after the visit. And this kind of comes to the shared decision making that we practice a lot in pediatric ENT because even though the child is our patient, um, the, the, the parents or the caregivers share a brunt of the decision making and the antibiotic administration and things like that. So the plan of initial management provides an opportunity for shared decision making with the child's family for those categories appropriate for initial observation. Biggest thing to know is if observation is offered, we must recheck these kids in 48 to 72 hours to make sure um, that the ear infection isn't progressing and they develop something like a mastoiditis. As far as uh, antibiotic therapy, um, first line treatment is high dose amoxicillin. Um, for you know, soft tissue infections, it's usually 40 to 50 milligrams per kilogram per day. But for ear infections, because there's so much bony <clears throat> bone in the middle ear um, and penetration is poor, you need high dose amoxicillin, 80 to 90 milligrams per kilogram per day, BID. There is a difference in how long you treat depending on age, which is important to know. Um, for two years and younger, we treat for 10 days, two to six years, usually about a week, and then over six days for over six years and five days. And a lot of that's um, because younger kids, it's more difficult for them to take the medicine. They're shaking their head. Their medicine's running down their face. It's everywhere. So we tend to treat longer just to make sure that they get um, appropriate uh, uh, antibiotic dosing. Um, the alternative to amoxicillin is Augmentin or amoxicillin clavulanate. And we use this if a person has gotten amoxicillin within the first, in, within the last 30 days or they have otitis conjunctivitis syndrome. Otitis conjunctivitis syndrome um, is when there's um, conjunctivitis in the setting of ear infection. And that is very typical of H. flu, which is more, uh, has a higher um, beta lactam resistance. So if they have um, conjunctivitis and they should be getting um, uh, augmented. And as ENTs, we don't do a lot of primary prescriptions for antibiotics, but from time to time we see a child that's not been on the appropriate antibiotic, and so it's important to know this information. Um, if they're penicillin allergic, um, then cephalosporins are appropriate. Ceftriaxone, um, which is an, um, usually given intramuscularly, um, is handy if they're unable to take oral medications or they have really severe penicillin allergies that are uh, characterized by IgE mediate events. Um, Bactrim um, is an okay medication. Um, macrolides like um, doxycycline and then clindamycin is probably um, probably my second line choice after amoxicillin. Um, it seems kids seem to tolerate it better um, than the others. Again, I think it's important to not memorize this, but be prepared to 
at least know the basics. So you will have kids in your office that have not been treated with appropriate antibiotics like azithromycin. And then you need to make sure that they you know, get switched to something that's going to actually treat their ear infection. Again, antibiotic failure is often for drug noncompliance or poor drug absorption or vomiting. Um, this is just going over what happens if they fail after the you know, first uh, couple of days if they're having severe symptoms still. And then um, you gotta just kind of go up the chain. To, so if you were, they were on amoxicillin, then you put them on, on Augmentin. If they were on Augmentin, you can put them on Ceftriaxone and just kind of go up the chain. So we get a lot of you know, questions about how do we prevent acute otitis media from parents. You know, there are some lifestyle modifications. Smoking is probably the big one. If um, you know, a kid is around a smoker, they have a lot of problems, you know, congestion, um, mucosal abnormalities, um, and it just causes a lot higher risk of ear infection. So smoking cessation is probably the number one lifestyle change that can be made. Um, breastfeeding is important, um, but it's very hard. We usually don't see kids till they're older and, and you know, if a child is not breastfeeding, by the time we see them, probably not gonna be able to get them to breastfeed. Uh, bottle propping, so, um, you know, this is a problem with kids being left unattended with a bottle that's just kind of propped up where they're holding it and they're completely flat and milk will pour right through the eustachian tubes into the middle ear. And you look and when you look in the ear, it's just white and it's, it's milk. Um, and so we may not see this in the clinic as much, but it's something to think about, um, you know, and sometimes the nurses will let me know, hey, you know, this mom just had the kid in the, in the high chair and, or the, sorry, the, the baby carrier and the, they were flat. And, and so that lets me know to educate the parents on bottle propping. Um, and I've had, a, you know, a couple kids that mom was bottle propping and we stopped and the, the ear infections went away. Uh, pacifiers. It's thought that the negative pressure um, kind of generated by pacifiers does help the eustachian tubes and um, kind of drain the ears, but it's a, a thin line about you know, when, not, when to stop their use. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends their use up to six months, but you know, ear infections are peak around one to two years. Um, um, so I always tell patients that they can help, but in the long run, it might be worse on the dentition and orthodontic um, they may develop orthodontic issues in the future. We talked about vaccines. Xylitol um, has been shown to decrease the incidence of ear infections, but you basically have to chew gum constantly, and kids at this age um, are at the age of ear infections don't readily chew gum. Um, daycare is a risk factor, um, but you can modify it. A lot of times if you take kids out of daycare, um, the incidence of ear infections go down. During COVID, we have seen a big reduction in ear infections because kids are not in daycare anymore. Um, it's a question of diet modification. A lot has come out over the last few years looking at inflammation of the air digestive tract, like eosinophilic esophagitis, and then um, some anecdotal evidence of maybe um, removing the things that cause inflammation, which are soy, dairy, wheat, and gluten, I believe. Um, may, or sorry, soy, dairy, wheat, and egg. Um, may actually decrease uh, mucosal edema and decrease ear infections. So ear tubes, um, we've all probably seen them, done them. Most common ambulatory surgical procedure with um, the last time anyone counted was about 700,207, 2007, excuse me. And I always joke, there's about as many ear tubes as there are surgeons. Um, you know, it just really depends on your preference Preference as far as which ear tubes that you use. Most people use some sort of collar button tube. T-tubes last longer because there's no outer flange. There's, um, there's a lots of combination of tubes. Um, what are the indications for ear tubes? So for acute otitis media, it's three episodes within six months, four episodes in the past year with one episode in preceding six months. A lot of times we'll have kids come in that have had three infections in the last six months. Um, I'm sorry, there are two infections in the last six months and the, parent, and the pediatrician wants them to be evaluated for ear tubes. And it's kind of hard to know like which direction they will go. I actually use risk factors a lot in my decision-making practice. So if they're kind of borderline, um, but they're in daycare and it's 
and it's on in, in October, then I'm probably more likely to recommend ear tubes. And if it's May and um, you know, the kids are out of school for the summer. So even though risk factors often aren't modifiable, they do help me in my decision making about those cases where I'm not sure if I'm going to put tubes or not. Or if I have a kid that's in an environment where there's smokers that help, don't plan on quitting, um, and that pushes me to do tubes sooner. So a big Cochrane review um, did show uh, benefits of ear tubes with improved hearing at three months and at six to nine months. There was mean reduction of 1.5 episodes of acute otitis media um, and a significant increase in children with, who had no additional otitis media whatsoever. Um, the quality of life scores um, that were mostly parent reported um, were vastly improved at 80% and obviously decreases the use of antibiotics. Even though we still occasionally have pediatricians that will put them on oral antibiotics for drainage, I do tell my, you know, my patients that, you know, don't let them do that. Just call us for ear drops and try to educate the pediatrician. Um, there are drawbacks to ear tubes. Um, you know, they do cause some changes in the eardrum with tympanosclerosis and tympanic membrane atrophy. Um, there is some debate on is this from the current infections or is that from the ear tube itself? Um, but a study in 2004 did find that there was a difference in ear, uh, PTA thresholds in kids that had tubes and kids that didn't. Um, so just something to think about, um, you know, most of us do tubes for the right reason, but we don't want to be putting in tubes. We don't have to because there are drawbacks. And then um, there are subjectively more perforations and cholesterol after putting in ear tubes. So we'll switch gears to some talk about kind of long-term complications and kind of some of the basic management. Um, from an epidemiologic standpoint, one out of 2,000 patients will have a complication from acute otitis media. So that's probably about 0.4%. However, because of the rise of, of resistance to antibiotics, but also um, kind of resistance to medical treatment, um, these complications may be on the rise. Um, most of the complications occur under the age of 20, 60 to 80%. Um, and vaccinations have resulted in a decline in certain complications, such as meningitis. So there are three pathways for otitis media to develop complications. Um, one is hematogenous spread, which basically means uh, via, oh, sorry, basically causes meningitis. And then probably the most um, extensive uh, pathway is direct extension through bone erosion or preformed or congenital pathways. And these are your abscesses, like your postauricular basalds, um, sigmoid sinus thrombosis, epidural abscesses, subdural empyemas, um, and then you can have extension um, into, into different uh, areas uh, just through preformed pathways. And then the third path, sorry, the third um, pathway for uh, complications is thrombophlebitis through of local perforating veins. Um, and so these are the, the diploic veins through the skull. Um, infection can spread along those routes as well. Complications are divided into extracranial and intracranial. Extracranial is the vast majority of, of uh, complications. Um, and they include mastoiditis, um, the abscesses we talked about, uh, postauricular basolds, which is down in the neck, temporal abscesses, satellite abscess, which is uh, suboccipital, you can have extension into the petrous apex, depending on the pneumatization, labyrinthine fistula, which is erosion into the bony labyrinth, facial process, which we see quite a bit um, in young kids, uh, acute superative labyrinthitis, encephalocele, CSF leak, and hearing loss. Um, intracranially, which is the minority, um, include brain abscess, subdural empyemas, epidural abscesses, lateral sinus thromboses, and otitic hydrocephalus. So it's hard to know sometimes, you know, why a kid is crying and grumpy. And so um, figuring out this often is not our job, luckily, but um, we want to be on the lookout for kids that may present um, um, with a possible complication. Otalgia can be seen just in ear infections as well as irritability, fever, and otorrhea. Um, more, you know, then we start to look at things like uh, post-auricular pain, um, 
or swelling that may be indicative of mastoiditis. Altered consciousness, if they're tired, if they're falling asleep, you can't rouse them, then you're worried for maybe a meningitis. Um, papilledema, which we um, don't readily look for, but the emergency room will often uh, look for. And then cranial nerve palsies in uh, neck stiffness or nuchal rigidity. So this is the classic posterior swelling on the left, and you can see there's some erythema there, probably an abscess forming, and this will push the, the lobule and the helix out. Um, otorrhea, I mean, if a kid has a lot of, of chronic otorrhea, then you're worried for a chronic process or, or mastoiditis. And this is an abducens nerve palsy, palsy on the right. The kid is actually trying to look left um, and the, uh, and the uh, eye's not moving on that left side because of the abductor abducens nerve nerve being out. I'm gonna shut that door. One second. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Okay, Gretton ego syndrome, that's a very hot board topic. What is it? Um, we talked about the abducens palsy. So the people, the kids get um, double vision. Uh, retroorbital pain is uh, the second part of the syndrome. What actually causes the pain is inflammation of the trigeminal ganglia. Um, so it causes pretty deep seated um, uh, intracranial pain and then otorrhea from uh, chronic otitis and um, a perforation of the eardrum. I think um, one of the most important things when thinking about complications is uh, this first one, which is determining the status of the ear prior to complication. So chronic ears that turn into complications are much different than if it's an acute otitis media that has a complication because acute is less likely to require surgery or requires a lower level of surgical intervention. Um, Antibiotic therapy um, is very important. Broad spectrum antibiotics at first, especially because there can be many organisms within the ear and there could be resistance. So um, you also want something that crosses the blood brain barrier. So vanc, unison, sulfosporins, and flagell are often used. We'll talk a little bit about anticoagulation. We, um, a lot of the uh, complications do cause thrombosis. Um, and it's controversial in both kids and adults, but um, we do want to prevent clot extension and embolization. I'm not going to go over this whole table. I put this in here. Um, one of my friends, an otologist at Ohio State, did this, but I think it's a good way to look at things. These complications are listed on the left. So encephalocele, CSF leak. Often they don't get antibiotics because you don't want to mask a meningitis, and this is a surgical, straightforward treatment. Um, these are most often post, uh, post-surgical um, complications. Meningitis, um, we treat with IV antibiotics and steroids. Steroids are very important to decrease the inflammation in the middle ear, or sorry, in the inner, in the inner ear. Um, we have a kid with otitic meningitis, um, again, like I said, if you, it's an acute ear, they're probably more likely to just to get a tympanocentesis or an ear tube versus a more chronic setting of a of chronic otitis media or, or chronic superlative otitis media, then they're probably going to get a mastoidectomy. Um, brain abscesses, subdural emphyemas, epidural abscesses are all going to get IV antibiotics. Um, often, if it's an acute um, ear, we'll at least put an ear tube in um, sometimes they do need a cortical mastoidectomy to uh, just to decompress the ear. Sigmoid sinus thrombosis, um, steroids, antibiotics, but also this is where we talk, we'll talk about anticoagulation on the next slide. Um, mastoidectomy is often done to decompress the sigmoid and get the, uh, be able to kind of um, irrigate the middle ear, um, get the infectious burden out. Um, clot removal, I've never done it. I don't, you know, if you, to kind of recanalize or open up the sigmoid sinus. Um, you can also ligate the IJ as well um, to prevent spread. 
otitic hydrocephalus is when there's inflammation um, uh, caused by an ear infection that causes decreased absorption of CSF and they get hydrocephalus. It's true with antibiotic steroids, um, anticoagulation, plus minus diuretics. And again, the same thing, mastoidectomy, um, plus minus clot removal, which is not uh, commonly performed. Um, there's not a lot of in the literature about anticoagulation, um, but a lot of our decision making is based on this paper. Um, is anticoagulation beneficial in acute mastoiditis complicated by sigmoid sinus thrombosis? So this is a literature review of 15 case studies and 21 case series. And long term, the rates of recanalization were similar between patients treated with anticoagulation versus not. Um, and there's even a small risk of bleeding sequelae within the anticoagulated group. However, prospectively looking at 170 children with cerebral sin sinovenous thrombosis of varying causes, so this does not have to be sigmoid sinus thrombosis, there was a relationship between no anticoagulation and a risk of death with a 5.2 odds ratio. So just based on the risk of death, most, pe most people are going to um, uh, recommend anticoagulation. Um, the bleeding sequelae that we're seeing uh, in the anticoagulated group were not severe. Um, so again, it's the data is kind of mixed, but I think most people would argue in favor of anticoagulation. I missed this slide. So going back to the complications, um, the mastoiditis here, um, again, if it's acute kid, we're usually just going to do ear tubes. Um, if it's more chronic, then a mastoidectomy is in, in you know, we'll, we'll do. For abscesses, um, we iron them. We often put an ear tube in. We often have a ton of granulation to tissue in the middle ear, so we put them on Cipradex. Another thing that's nice is the otiprio, which is the um, polymer. At room temperature, it's liquid, and at body temperature, it is. Uh, more solid form and you can put it in the middle ear. It has, um, it has a ciprofloxacin and, and uh, I think dexamethasone in it, but it will actually stay in the middle ear and you can actually inject it during the surgery and it will stay there instead of like running out and then you, the people don't have to keep putting it in. That sometimes is nice for the kids that have a lot of granulation tissue in the middle ear. Uh, Petrus apocytis. Um, these kids usually do get a mastoidectomy because you want to open up that drainage pathway from the petrous apex. Um, sometimes people have talked about, you know, opening up the petrous apex as well, but that doesn't appear to uh, be necessary as long as they have a clear pathway of drainage to the mastoid. Um, labyrinthine fistula, just like with anything, you would remove disease and do the fistula repair. There's a high rate of hearing loss with this. Um, I want to talk about just the facial nerve palsy, we do see it in young kids often with middle ear eff uh, effusions. They don't even have to have like a really hot looking ear. Um, and our, you know, we basically do IV antibiotics um, and ear tubes. We always debate steroids and it's attending uh, dependent because there's been minimal benefit with steroids, but um, I often will um, recommend steroids just because I think it was my kid, I'd put them on steroids to be honest. Um, facial nerve decompression and uh, mastoidectomy is often not necessary in a, an acute otitis media, but it can be if it's a more chronic uh, picture. And acute separative labyrinthitis. And these kids are sick. Um, they're dizzy, they're vomiting, they're febrile. Um, we often treat with ivyanics and steroids to prevent um, inner, uh, ossification of the labyrinth. And then um, I am more aggressive with these kids and they um, get an ear tube. And if they're uh, probably cortical mastoidectomy to kind of decrease the inflammation as much as possible. A couple pearls on post-op uh, care, you know, plugging of the tubes is kind of the bane of pediatric ENT because you put tubes in and the kids have these huge mucoid effusions and then they get plugged and they come back in the clinic and they have these plug tubes and we often don't have effusion or erythema but you just feel bad that the tubes are plugged so I usually put them on drops for a round and a probably 50-50 of that. And then if they don't open up, then I'll just kind of manually um, open them up in clinic. Um, if it's after six months, though, it may just be natural early extrusion and they have skin growing on that, on that inner um, surface of the eardrum and that can be very painful to manipulate. So I don't, um, I, I do not try to open up at that point. Um, maybe I'll put eardrops. And then um, 
if I do put kids on drops for a plug tube, I do it for 10 days. Those little ear speculums can sometimes help the parents get the drops into the ear if they're having problem. Um, and then one thing I will say too about the Otiprio, I like it when I put tubes in kids that have small ear canals, like in Down syndrome, um, I often put the Otiprio in um, through the tube during that surgery because they often have really mucoid effusions and we struggle getting the tubes in because of the small canals, but also just struggle with, you know, eardrops and things. So um, during the surgery, I often put Otiprio in um, and I feel that um, it helps the parents don't, then don't have to do post-operative drops. Um, water precautions kind of, you know, vary by attending. Uh, Meta-analysis showed no benefit uh, of uh, post-operative complications with earplugs. Um, there was a prospective control study in 2000 that did show benefit with earplugs. Um, so our group recommends earplugs if um, kids are doing more than surface swimming, so if they're going more than a couple feet deep. Um, also, if there are going to be in any sort of dirty water, like a lake or a river or a pond, um, and then if they do, a lot, if they like to like submerge their hair, their heads in the bath water for long periods of time, then um, the soapy water can get into tubes. So those are the three reasons that we usually recommend ear tubes. Otherwise, we just uh, don't for surface swimming, which most kids the age of ear tubes um, do, then they don't really need them. 20 to 30 percent of children will need a second set of ear tubes um, and that's big risk factor is a younger age at the first set of ear tubes so if you get an ear tube at eight months and then they're out at at um 20 months and you're likely you know to get another uh, set of tubes just based on age and risk factors and then we do recommend adenoidectomy most of the time for second ear tube surgeries because it reduces 50 by 50 percent the need for further uh, ear tubes and that is it. So um, my email is here. Please email me with any questions or comments. Um, stay safe and uh, thank you for the opportunity to do a lecture. Thank you so much. That was great. So we'll have the recording up on the website tomorrow morning. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.